Hey everybody, my name is Brandon from Basic Wisdom. Today we'll talk yield to maturity. All right, as always, let's go ahead and get the question on the board. Okay, so we have a, looks like a yield to maturity question. And uh, a lot of numbers. Uh, let's go ahead and read through it first, and then we'll, we'll discuss yield of maturity. In 2017, Jane Smith buys one IBM 6% $1,000 par bond. Uh, it matures in to- uh, 2027, and that's what the M stands for. M stands for maturity. Uh, at 105, another way of saying $1,050 in bond terms. The bond is callable at 102 in five years, and it pays interest on January 1st and July 1st. And then they get to the question, which is, what is the yield to maturity? And there is a formula associated with the yield to maturity, and you could do that formula for this question. And as you can see, there, there are a lot of parts to that formula. If you take your annual interest rate or your annual coupon and subtract out your annualized discount or premium, I'll, I'll talk to that. And then divide that by the average bond price, which I will also talk about. That's how you get to answering the yield of maturity question just based upon the calculation. The way that I would probably prefer that you do this question and focus on this question does not involve the equation at all. That might seem crazy, but once we start putting a bunch of concepts together, concepts outside of just what the yield of maturity technically is then you'll start seeing that there are some moving parts. And there are some quick ways that you can even eliminate answers almost right off the bat. I'll get there. I want to do the hard calculation first, and then I'll show you the shortcut and, and probably the quicker and better way to do it afterwards. So let's go ahead and start plugging in the numbers into the actual formula. And through that process, we'll be able to see that, there, that there's a lot of information in this question that's just not important to us. So let's start with the first part. We need our annual interest payment. Jane buys one IBM 6% $1,000 par bond. That 6% is all you need to determine how much you get out of your bond interest-wise every year. Every single question they give you in terms of bonds, the first yield they provide or the first percentage that they provide is always the, the coupon or the nominal rate. And it tells you if you buy this bond, the issuer is going to pay you that much money based upon par every single year. So if we just do some quick number crunching, 6% of par, which is 1000 this bond is paying $60 a year to whoever owns the bond. So we got to put that 60 in there. The second part is they're asking us for this annualized discount or premium. And it's just a fancy way of saying figure out what the premium or the discount is and then divide it by however many years there are until maturity. And that's it. So we look at this bond, and and Jane buys it at 105, which is another way of saying 1,050. You've probably learned in your materials so far that par is kind of the even playing space. When the bond is at $1,000, it's not at a premium, it's not at a discount, it's at neither. So we have a $50 premium bond. It's $50 over the $1,000 par, Trading at 1,050, par is 1,000. If we take that $50 premium and put it over the 10 years it has until maturity, our annualized premium is $5. We're buying the bond at 1,050. It's going to pay us $1,000 in 10 years. So it's kind of like we're losing $5 a year. Whenever you have a premium, you subtract that number. And I think that makes sense, right? That's you're losing money over time but you subtract that number from the annualized interest you get. If this was a discount, you would add. Of course it's not. And that's it for the numerator, we're done with that. Great. Now for the bottom part, all it tells us is that we need the average bond price. Now to be a little bit more specific there with average bond price, all you need is the par value, and you add the par value to the market price of the bond, and then just figure out what the average is between the two prices. And that's all you're doing. The bond is at $1,000 par. If you add in $1,050 and then divide that by two, you'll get $1,025, and that is our average bond price. So once you plug in those numbers, it's a fairly simple calculation from there. All we do is we take our 55 and then put that over our average bond price of $1,025, and you'll get the answer. The answer is A, right? Now, for the test you're studying for, that's the traditional way of answering that question. 
you calculate the yield of maturity, and bam, the answer is right there. If you're comfortable with the process we just went through, then do it. Just hold on to that. So for those of us who have a hard time remembering the yield of maturity calculation, and, and when I first started studying, I was one of those people, there is a different way to do it. I'll be upfront and honest, and I'll let you know that what I'm about to teach you does not actually get you the right answer, but what it does is it eliminates all the wrong answers for you. So through process of elimination, you get to the right answer, and this will work on the test, absolutely. In order to get the right answer using our alternative means of getting there, we do have to understand the relationship between prices and yields with a bond. The first step that we go through in this process will usually eliminate two and maybe even three answers and get you to the right answer right away. Now, we need to use a very specific tool to, for us to get there, and that tool is something called the bond seesaw. The bond seesaw is a visual representation of what happens to prices of bonds when interest rates go up or down. And when you buy a bond at a certain price, what that means for your yield to maturity. Now for our bond seesaw, on the left hand side we've got prices, and those are prices of bonds trading in the secondary market. There's really three different yields that we'll focus on for this question. And that's the nominal yield, which is actually in the middle, that's in the middle of the seesaw, remember that doesn't change for the life of the bond. We've got our current yield, which is the next yield. And we've got our yield to maturity, which is, you know, for this example is gonna be last. Technically, there is a fourth yield, and that's yield to call, but for this question, that's not an important yield, so we're not even going to talk about it. If you forget the order of the yields, then this way of answering the question is not going to work for you. You're going to get the wrong answer. It goes nominal, current yield, yield to maturity, and yield to call. Now, once again, we're not going to talk about yield to call, so that'll be the last time I mention yield to call, but we need to remember that nominal, current yield, yield to maturity, that is our order of the yields, and it never changes. You'll see why later that's important. If the seesaw is exactly in the middle and isn't teetering on either side, then that's indicative of a par bond. And when you have a par bond, all of your yields across the board are exactly the same. Your nominal rate is the same as your current yield, is the same as your yield to maturity, and is also the same as your yield to call. But that's only if the bond is trading exactly at par. And we know with this question that is not the case. The bond is trading at 105, which is a premium. When we have a bond trading at a premium, the seesaw looks more like this. When you see a bond seesaw where the price side is up and the yield side is down, you can tell right away that that is a premium bond. And if we think about this question here, Jane bought the bond at a premium, so it's gonna look like this. So what, what does that tell us about the yield of maturity? Well, if the price of the bond is above $1,000, that must mean that the yield of maturity has to be less than the coupon rate. Remember, that middle coupon rate is 6%. So if the yield of maturity is below the coupon rate, then it's gotta be below 6%. That allows us to get rid of answer C and answer D. They're both above 6%. We know the yield of maturity has to be below 6%. And just by doing that one step, it gets us down to a 50-50. We know it's gotta be A or it's gotta be B. When you get a yield to maturity question on the test, it's most likely going to be at a premium or a discount. So when you get the question, eliminate what you can right away. Now, as, now as we focus back on the yields, remember that we have three yields there in a very specific order. We have our nominal yield, we have our current yield next, and then we have our yield to maturity. Now we got rid of C and D because we knew that the yield to maturity had to be below 6%, but that still leaves us with A or B. Some of you may have already noticed this before I'm even getting there, but we have one more yield there. It's the current yield. And based upon the current structure of the bond seesaw, we know that the yield of maturity has to be also below the current yield. Now, the current yield is another calculation, but it is a very easy calculation. The current yield is just when you take your annual interest rate and throw it over the market price of your bond. Very easy. So we take 60 and we throw it over 1,050. And when you do the formula, magically, you get 5.71%, which is also B. But remember that what we just did was a current yield calculation, not the yield of maturity calculation. And what that tells us is that because 5.71% is the current yield, we can get rid of that and cross that off. And we can safely assume that A is the answer. So as you can see, we never actually got the answer of 5.37%. 
we just went through a process of eliminating the wrong answers. Remember, use the bond seesaw to your advantage. Uh, just based upon the fact that the bond was a premium, we could get rid of two answers right away, and then we just had to do one other easy calculation on top of that. Now, in, in full disclosure, depending on the licensing vendor that you use, you might come across a question they provide you where this method does not work. And they may even recommend that you just memorize the yield and maturity formula. Now, in my experience, I've sent over a thousand students that have taken and passed the exam, and I've never gotten feedback that my method here does not work, or my method on the actual test leaves more than one answer there on the board. So you'll just have to decide which way you go with this. We talked about how to do it through the formula. We also talked about how to do it through process of elimination. Whichever way you do it, in my opinion, will lead you to the right answer on the actual test. Please subscribe to this channel. Check out the links and resources below. Thank you, and I'll see you again.